Good morning, church family. It's very nice to be here with you. And I wish to thank your pastors for the invitation to come and spend some time with you today and to share the word together. Uh, in my role as the ministerial secretary, I get to work among our pastors and their families. It's nice to see Svetlana. It was great to see uh, Ricardo again today. Um, I understand Ricardo's family is in the wars a bit today, and Sandra's home with the young ones. But um, great to be with you, and as we open God's Word today, we're going to Romans chapter 12. By the way, I was speaking with one of your former ministers, David Yeo, yesterday, and he sends his warm greetings and love to you. I understand you've been working your way through the book of Romans, sections of Romans. And Zenny has asked me to speak from Romans chapter 12 today. So let's take a moment to look at the first two verses together. I'll be reading from the New International. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's just put some of this on the screen together as we look at it carefully. He begins with the word, therefore. Now, the word, therefore, implies that he's just explained something. Therefore, we respond. Now, I think you were in chapters 7 and 8 last week. But if you were to read through entire chapters 1 through to 11, you'll discover that Paul is explaining the wonders of God's grace, the tender mercy of God that as it was just sung for us, that he would clothe our sinfulness with his perfect white robe of, of righteousness, that he would forgive me for all I ever did, even without me having to be good enough for that, without me having to earn that, that I can say simply, thank you, Jesus, for your gift to me, and that he would cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Paul says, therefore, in view of such grace, such mercy, what is an appropriate response? Well, at the end of chapter 11, there's this wonderful praise known as the doxology where it says, Oh, the depths and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now Paul says, praise is good. But in view of all that he's done, there needs to be a, a practical response as well. In chapter 12, he goes on to detail for us the practical response of every Christian to live a life in praise to the glory of God. Let's unpack chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What comes to mind when you read this verse? What word pictures from the old slain upon the altar? And it's interesting because he uses the words living sacrifice, which seems an oxymoron, doesn't it? And the first hearers might have thought, well, Paul, you need to choose between the word living or the word sacrifice. Which is it going to be? But he's put them together, a living sacrifice. Tell me, who dies in this arrangement? When you come to Christ, who dies? The old self. The old self. In a sense, I die. 
And who lives? Who is the living part of the living sacrifice? So Paul is urging us, in view of Christ's sacrifice for you, to offer your bodies in response as living sacrifices, dead to yourself and alive to him. I wonder if I can ask one of my sons, I don't know if Luca would come up, but Peyton, can you come up for me? I'm a bit thirsty, so Peyton's going to pour me a drink. A living sacrifice. While Peyton's doing that, let me share with you a quote which might explain the title of today's message, which, which is the words, no limit. Sister White gives us a statement. Thank you, Peyton. It looks great. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. Did you catch that? There is no limit to the usefulness of one who laying self aside, there's the dying sacrifice, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon the heart, there's the living. If we would take Paul's urging to us today, Ellen White says there is no limit to the usefulness of such a person. To be absolutely surrendered. Paul says this is your true and proper worship. The word in the Greek there is logic. This is your logical worship. Now when we think of the word logical, what do we think of? Words like reasonable, makes sense, it's logical. But the Greeks and the Jewish writers would use this word logical, or logic, to describe the inner, the spiritual, the whole person being in integrity together and being holistic. So what Paul is urging us is to give ourselves in response to God's mercy to us as living sacrifices, dead to self, alive to him, and that this would be worship which comes from the inner person all the way out, that this would be a holistic response, not just your physical body, but when they spoke of the body, they meant the entire body. And you see that throughout the book of Romans. Now, Peyton has poured me a drink over here. He had two glasses to choose from. I'm so glad he chose this one. Thank you, Peyton. Where are you? Why didn't you choose this one? It's got dirt in it, dead bugs and dirt. I'm so glad you didn't pour that one. I would have had to drink it up here. It's the same. God is looking to fill his people with his spirit. And he's looking for an empty glass. He's not looking for the glass that's full of my nonsense and my rubbish. And so as God is looking for people to fill, and as we wish to be filled with the Spirit, there's a laying aside of the self that needs to happen in order for Him to truly fill us. Let's look at the next part. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I find it interesting that he uses the word conform. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not be squished into its mold. When you think of the world and you think of the mold and you think of the pattern of the world, what comes to mind? Think with me. When you think of the world, do you think of a pattern that everybody's following? I mean, is it, is it really a pattern? Is it evil? Is it sports? Is it money? Is it sex? What is the pattern of this world that Paul urges us not to be conformed into? I like what Eugene Peterson says here in the message. It's a paraphrase, not a translation, but it gives us some good thoughts. He says in the same 
his paraphrase of Romans 12 too. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Do not be squished. Do not be conformed. Do not be molded by the world. What is this molding that the world does? What is this pattern that the world has? The word world there, by the way, is the Greek word aeon, from which we have the word eon, the generation, a time. Don't be conformed to the pattern of your time, your culture. What is it? Well, the context actually gives it to us. We're going to look at that in a moment. The pattern of this world. What is it? In the context of Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul is saying, don't be full of yourself. Don't live for this. Don't live for yourself. Put that on the, on the altar. Let it be sacrificed and be renewed daily. Let your mind be renewed daily and filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no limit to the usefulness of one who laying self aside makes room for the filling of the Spirit. Don't live for yourself. Live for something greater than yourself. Live for someone greater than yourself. Be alive. Allow God to take your dead, old self and way of living and fill it with someone that lives and is alive and brings about in you a transformation. What does that transformation look like? When the Holy Spirit comes into a person and begins to shape and change them, I think of it like this. Imagine Jesus had your voice and your friends and your body and your looks and your family and your car and your bank balance and your job. What would he be like? What would that be like if Jesus could transform us? And Paul says that's not like a pattern. It's not a, a, a squishing into a mold for every Christian. He says, no, that's something that lives. The Holy Spirit living in you transforms you as you abide in him. And you become God's intended design for you as you begin to reflect Jesus and his love. What is it like to regularly abide in the presence of Jesus? Because that's the only way you're going to lay self aside. And it's the only way to be filled with God's spirit. You can't come on a Sabbath and get everything you need for the week. No minister, no teacher, no, no pastor can explain to your heart what needs to be laid aside. And what God wants to say to you the only one who can explain all of that to you is waiting for you and I to take time to be with him, to say, Lord, what is the pattern of this age that I live in that you want me to sacrifice? What would you say to me about what I must lay down in my life? And what is it that you want to create in me? What is it you want to do in me? What is it you want to change and transform by my mind? Jesus invites you to come wholeheartedly to someone greater than yourself so that he may transform you to be like he intends you to be. No longer living for yourself, but living for him. He goes on to say that anyone who does this is a promise. And these promises which are laced throughout scripture, I encourage you to find them because as you're praying, as you're reflecting, as you're sitting with the scriptures in front of you, these promises are the things, they're like checks. We don't use checks much these days, but they're like promised, guaranteed payments that you can read back to God, that you can pray back to God and say, God, you wrote it. It's a check. I'm asking you to give it to me. Here's a promise. He says this. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Then you lay self aside and you abide in him 
and you're transformed by his spirit, he says, then you become able to test and approve what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What's it like to be within the will of God for your life? That's where the peace is. That's where the beautiful relationship with God lies. That's where the harmony comes when your relationships around you. Jesus promises it. He says, lay down your life. Offer it as a living sacrifice to me. Allow me to transform you. And I promise you, you will know the assurance of being right within my will for your life. Because I'll explain it to you. Well, let's go on now to verse 3. There's a point I want to bring out here. Notice this. He says, offer your bodies. Is that plural or singular? Plural, isn't it? Offer your bodies. Each of you offer your body. As how many living sacrifices? This is fascinating to me. He says to us, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he goes on to teach about this. Look in verse 3 with me. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you. Okay, so is he just talking to the teachers here today? Or is he just talking to the youth? Or just the ladies? Or just the children? No, every single one of you. So let's listen. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each one of us has one body with how many members? Many. One body, many members, and each of these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, here comes his point, we, though many, form how many bodies? One. Paul's saying to us, each of us, consider your walk with Christ in this way. We are members of one body. We are not all called to do our own individual thing as islands. We're not called to all be all things. By working together, we can operate like a body operates. And Paul is calling us to lay down the right to live my way through life as a sacrifice and take up God's calling on my life to actively be renewed day by day and to operate as a member of one body. Offer your bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice, singular. And I imagine what it's like to have a church family where every member has given up the right to live my way. And we have embraced instead Jesus and his way. What is that sort of church like? Well, if there's no limit to the usefulness of one who laying self aside makes room for the Holy Spirit, what limits could there be on a church of people who offer their bodies as living sacrifices? No? Bodies as a living sacrifice. One church, one body. All the members have given up the right to live their own way and now live for Jesus Christ. Well, let me show you a little video which I think illustrates from creation beautifully the concept of living for a greater purpose. The stage of the investigation was to find out what one of these subterranean cities looked like. The amount of cement required is extraordinary. For three days they kept pouring until ten tons of cement had disappeared down the tubes. After a month, they begin the excavation, led by Professor Louise Forci.
takes weeks to uncover the secret megalopolis of the ants. With the help of mechanical diggers, the scientists remove tons of earth. At last, they begin to see the structure of the city-state. There are subterranean highways connecting the main chambers, and off the main routes are side roads. The paths branch and lead to many fungus gardens and rubbish pits. The tunnels are designed to ensure good ventilation and provide the shortest transport routes. Everything looks like it has been designed by an architect, a single mind. But of course that isn't true. This colossal and complex city was created by the collective will of the ant colony, the super-organism. The structure covers 50 square meters and goes 8 meters into the earth. In its construction, the colony moved 40 tons of soil. Billions of ant loads of soil were brought to the surface. Each load weighed four times as much as the worker, and in human terms, was carried a kilometer to the surface. It's incredible, isn't it? Now you suppose that each ant said, I'm not going to surrender. I'm going to do things my way, I'm going to do my thing. What would we have? You just couldn't have what you just saw there. But there's something greater than the ant, and that is the purpose that the Creator made it for. And there's something greater for us too, than just living as an island, living for my own purposes, which is the pattern of this world. And by giving up the pattern of this age or this world, and embracing God's ideal, God's design for us as a church to be a living sacrifice, dead to self, but alive to his purposes. My friends, the church becomes something incredibly powerful. We're not building anthills. We are building a living organism of love that transforms the communities. It brings people to Jesus and it brings them into a loving relationship with us too. You know, the rest of Romans 12, if you read it sometime, it goes on to say, we're all different. And whatever Jesus has given you to do, do it with all your heart. Let him do it through you. We all have different gifts. If you are into teaching or prophesying, then do it the best you can. If you're into serving, then serve with all your heart. If it's teaching, then teach. If you're an encourager, then give encouragement. If you're called to give, then give generously. If you're called to lead, do it diligently. If you're called to show mercy, do it cheerfully. But the point is this, whatever God gives you to do, do it with all your heart. Surrender this and live for him and his purposes. I'm going to finish the teaching part in love chapter, nine today, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. The rest of chapter 12 goes on to say a whole lot of instruction about how to love, to practically love. But he starts with this, love must be sincere. It must be sincere. The Greek word, anipikritos, from which we get the word unhypocritical. Love must be without hypocrisy. The love that we are called to give must come from here not just here. We may be good at explaining how to love. We may be good at understanding how love works. We may be good at recognizing love, but love must come from the whole body, the whole person. Otherwise, it isn't love. And it doesn't transform. And as Adventists, let me finish with saying this. We ought to be the most loving Christians on planet Earth. Because our teaching, our understanding of Scripture is so filled with God's love. 
We've got it here, but it must come from here. You think about our understanding of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, together for how long? Eternity. They have been living in a perfect love relationship since forever. And then they say, let us make man in our image. And they make a man. And we understand that God formed him from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils. Man becomes a living soul. What's the first thing mankind sees? Someone's just breathed him into life through his nostrils. What's the first thing he sees? It's the face of God. That's how we teach the creation of man, Adventists. And then the next thing that happens, he sees that man is alone. God recognizes the need for relationship between man and a woman. And so he brings to the man someone made from his side, fashioned after his own flesh, a woman. And the two of them, having been separated into two, now God makes the two back into one. And in the image of God, three but one, we now have two but one. God has built himself into this image. And we go on, we teach the very next thing that happens Friday night. God gives them Sabbath. What's Sabbath about? God and man, Adam and Eve. It's this relationship between God and us and mankind with each other that flows throughout the entire set of our teachings. You go down to the cross where sin had broken the relationship with God. You remember God says to Adam, where are you, Adam? His relationship is broken. And Adam then does what? He says to God, it was her fault. And the relationships this way are broken too. And so sin has broken this relationship. And Jesus comes on the cross and he restores God's relationship with man. And he restores man's relationship to each other through this thing called forgiveness. Have you received his forgiveness? Have you passed it on? Look at the way we teach death. You don't go from the earth when you die straight to heaven one by one, single file. You don't go down to a place called hell where there's this eternal burning torment. No, God teaches in scripture that you sleep. Why? Because you're waiting a marriage supper that's coming. And when we go to heaven, my friends, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says we are going together in community. And when we get there, there's this great celebration because we are now reunited. We are married. The church and Jesus, it's like a wedding takes place. Highly relational God that we teach about. And why do you want to be in heaven? Is it for the streets of gold? Is it for the great mansion on the hill? Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Why? Fast forward a little bit. So that where I am, you can be too. The reason you want to be in heaven is because we're going to be with Jesus and we're going to be with each other and we're all going home together. And that's what we teach. That's one of the reasons I'm an Adventist. By the way, while we wait for that day to come, what are we called to do? These three angels in Revelation chapter 14, what's the first one's message? I saw an angel in midair. He had the everlasting gospel, which is God restoring his relationship with mankind. And it was to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, people. So until Jesus comes, every Adventist is called to this ministry of reconciling people with Jesus and sharing your life and your love with everyone around you. I'm proud to be an Adventist. Here's my challenge to all of us. As you reflect on Romans chapter 12, have you offered yourself as a living sacrifice? A living sacrifice. Are you making time for the Holy Spirit to live in you? To listen to him? As you read his word, is it, is it getting time to, to, to change you? Are you listening for what he wants to say to you? Have you chosen to be transformed? 
Are you willing to let him change you? And finally, are you willing to let him teach you to love without any hypocrisy? A love that rises from the heart, that's real, that comes out through your wallet, through where your feet take you, through what your hands do, through where your, your lips, how they form and speak to people, through your ears to listen to those that need listening to. Has his love transformed you without hypocrisy so that you can love others? What a challenge. And finally, this beautiful thought that as each of us lays down our individual agenda, goal, lives, we become a body a living sacrifice. And my friends, to the usefulness of a church that does that, I believe there is no limit. May God bless each of us.